Hi, good morning. My name is Scott Reed. This is Nicole Nagel. This is Joshua Browning. We're students at Austin Center for Design. And for the past eight weeks, we've been researching civic engagement. And when we began this, the first thing we wanted to understand was, well, what is civic engagement? And what we found is that civic engagement can be broken down into three general categories, community, electoral, and political. So an example of community engagement is participating in a local organization, perhaps your neighborhood association. Um, and then an example of electoral is voting. That's what usually comes first of mind. However, another example of voting could be expressing a political point of view about a particular candidate or an issue. And then the third is political. And so when we think about political, that's actually contacting officials about um, matters that are important to you. And it can also be things like signing a ballot measure. So for us, that was how we thought of civic engagement when we started. And so our research focus was to understand how low-income Austinites articulate their viewpoints through the city government with the goal of uncovering inclusive ways to enable civic engagement and representation in this rapidly changing city in which we all live. So our next question was also, well, why is civic engagement important? Why should it matter? So we heard from a woman named Laura in East Austin who had recently experienced for the first time getting involved with her community. And it was specifically related to something in her own backyard. She was concerned about a six-story condo that was going to be built, and that was going to block her view. She started talking with her neighbors about it, found out that it was a common issue that she shared with her neighbors. She got involved with the neighborhood association, and they began to actively lobby for change related to that building. Well, now today, that building is only going to be three stories. So this is an opportunity where civic engagement can protect an individual's interests in the beginning, so Laura's view, and then also protect her neighbors, her community's um, needs as well. And so that's what civic engagement can do. That's just one example of the power of civic engagement. And so that's why this topic is so important to us. So what we've <coughs> done in our research is design research, where we set out to empathize and to understand the points of view of a variety of Austinites. And what we wanted to do was to talk with them and also observe them in, in moments where they were engaging civically. So for example, we went to city council, which is an example of political, and we observed people participating with city council and being civically engaged there. We went and voted and observed voters and talked with voters on election day, and that's an example of electoral. And then we also went to, as an example, community Thanksgiving dinners, observed citizens and participated as citizens, and then talked with them as well about their experience. And that's an example of people participating in civic engagement from a community perspective. So in summary, that was what we have been working on. And so what we'd like to do today is to share with you our key insights and to share additional stories with you about what we heard. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Nicole. Thanks, Scott. So, <laughs> so one thing that we found was that many low-income Austinites don't use the government as a platform to articulate their viewpoints. Um, and so we wonder, why is that? Where is this barrier with the government? And, um, you know, our, this first started with our observations, our initial observations when we first got out and attended city council meetings, as Scott mentioned. And you enter this big, um, impressive room. You go into the city hall chambers, and there's these podiums. The city council members are all raised above you. People are in suits. It's a very formal process. And in order to speak, there's also a formalized sign-up process and agenda process. 
And then what we found when we went out and spoke with citizens is that they felt that the government wasn't for them. Elton, a man we met who was um, getting citizens to sign a petition outside of a community Thanksgiving dinner, one of the first things he told us when we started speaking with him about his initiatives is that government is a king's sport, like horse racing. You need to be rich to play. And another woman we spoke with at uh, a community Thanksgiving dinner said that she felt that she wasn't government's, uh, or wasn't government's customer. Specifically thinking about the police force, when she called the police when she felt unsafe and she was chased or another time when her car was hit, every time she had these interactions, the police didn't take her side. And she felt, they're not here to serve me. I'm not their customer. So there's this barrier that they feel with government that they're really not here for them or it's not really composed of people here to help citizens. And coupled with that very formal process that we experienced ourselves, we came to this feeling that the formality of the processes and the perceived affluence of those involved, you know, you look at who's already involved, it's all you know, people in suits, it's people who seem to have money. There's this barrier that comes up and people feel as if they don't belong in a political setting because of this. So. What happens when people do have an issue or a viewpoint they want to articulate? That's where Josh is going to speak to you. So, thanks, Nicole. So, this comes to our second idea of what's going on in this space. When they do break, to the, <coughs> break through that barrier that Nicole talked about of being um, like perceived and like this affluent, it's not for me, I don't belong. When they do have an issue that they do, they feel need, they need to articulate. There's this barrier also that we're seeing of sort of an insecurity. I'll tell you a little story about Ellen. Um, she approached one of her councilmen in her district on, on the street, and she told him about a parking issue that she had. And he addressed her and said that he would think about it and take it back, but she didn't hear anything from it. Um, and initially, in our conversations, he said, I'm angry at him. And she said it kind of playfully. But as the conversation went on, she said, well, the councilman probably thought I was just some crazy person bugging at him. And she went on to express this point. And it's this idea of, well, um, I'm not, they're not going to take me seriously because they think I'm just a complainer. Because they get a million people complaining to me every day because they're councilmen. They're these big, important people. And I'm just another person who's contributing to this. Um, complaint society. Another idea of this insecurity came from an interaction we had with a woman on the bus. Um, she had just been out of prison, actually, and she had an ankle bracelet on. Um, she said, um, I, we, we asked her what her how she um, articulates her viewpoints to governments. She said she doesn't really do that. Um, she says, I should know better. I don't speak my mind with government because I used to be part of the problem. And so it's this idea that she's, she's not going to outreach to it because she's insecure about herself and like what she's bringing to this solution. It's this idea that many Austinites perceive their participation um, as unwelcome, as disruptive, sort of intrusive to uh, these people who are working on these big problems. Um, and this insecurity holds them back from initiating communication. <laughs> and that, coupled with the fact that they believe that it's a king sport, is one, it, it adds to the barriers. We have this concept map, uh, concept map that, I apologize if it's not, uh, you can come closer if you can't see it from there, but it's basically entitled, What's Holding Me Back? And it's these ideas of I don't belong, perceived intrusion, that are creating barriers between me outreaching myself to government, like telling them about my problems, but it's also the opposite. These programs and resources can't get into them. They can't break that barrier because they have, they have these things, these insecurities about not belonging and perceived intrusion and also vulnerability, which Nicole will talk to you a little bit more about right now. Right, so you know, put yourself in a place where you feel like you, you feel outside of the people that you need to communicate with, that you finally decide to, to take that leap. If 
you, and you're putting yourself in a vulnerable position <coughs> where you are, you know, potentially emotionally fragile. You're opening yourself up to, into a situation where you don't feel comfortable. And if you don't feel that you're met with respect, then you shut down. And so this is a key opportunity within the government process that when citizens don't feel that they're being heard or really listened to, then they close the door on the government often permanently. And we found that with Donna, she is a diabetic and she's reached out to the government for help with medical benefits. She's you know, low income, minimum wage, she works really hard every day and she even has taken it upon herself to be an activist for others, but not through government processes, through you know, rallying through civic participation and fighting for a $15 minimum wage. But she says she's lost faith completely in government itself. She's tried and tried and decided that they aren't listening, they always ignore her, she's done. Another woman we met on the bus, Lorna, she used to work in the Parks and Rec Department uh, in other cities prior to moving to Austin and then in Austin as well. And she worked to uh, create classes and engagement opportunities, development opportunities for people within the Parks Department. And she, she landed on this not having any community. She, she went from trying to help and trying to be engaged to thinking that nothing was ever going to change and that the government didn't really do anything. And every time we, we asked what is really going on there, she would just cut us off. She wouldn't go into it because she had already put up this wall and would say, the point is, almost no matter what question we asked her, the point is, nothing is ever going to change. She, she had resigned to the fact that government was never going to help her. She was alone. She felt she had no sense of community no family, and, and no support system within the government either. So just to recap kind of what, what Josh was talking about, we have this, this barrier where people feel that the government isn't for them, and so there's this insecurity of actually reaching out in the first place and making that first move. And once you do, if you're not met with respect, then you shut down. And this is something we found across a lot of our participants, across um, income ranges as well. But particularly this feeling of that your voice is important, we found with a lot of our low income participants. So, you know, one of our next steps is how might we help people overcome the fear of taking that first step? And then from there, how, how might we help people feel listened to and respected, even if their solution is, or their problem isn't something that we can immediately take an actionable solution towards. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Scott to Great. talk about where we're at. Great. Thanks, Nicole. So we are on path with, uh, I guess, our project plan. So we are ready to begin Insight Combination and working with the other two teams. And we're really excited about that. And we see that's going to be a lot of richness in uh, coming together and learning from one another. And I think that's really started happening since last week as well, which has been exciting. Um, and then we do have two scheduled interviews. Uh, we have one scheduled on Monday with a citizen that we're very excited to talk with, and then one on Tuesday with a local community organizer, and we feel that he's going to have a, a lot to share with us. Uh, and uh, so we're excited about bringing those uh, to the table as well. So we're gonna continue the uh, relevant field research as we begin inside combination. So thank you.